skeletal muscle is your body armor. We have to understand that it's not if, it's a when we are going to face a health challenge. This is part of our humanness. Our safeguard against that for when it happens, not if, is skeletal muscle. We have to do everything in our power to hone in and focus on skeletal muscle from this perspective. This is the Business of Advice podcast, where we help good advisors become great business owners. I am super excited about this podcast, uh, not just because of our guest who is amazing, you're gonna hear that, uh, but because of the impact that I think this podcast is gonna have on so many of you that listen to this. Uh, really successful, hard-charging entrepreneurs, a lot of times we sacrifice our health in that pursuit. Uh, a lot of you know, and you've heard me talk about the just focus on my own health over the past few years. And today I'm joined by one of the people that has been probably one of the top three influences on me over these past few years, which is crazy because before today we've actually never met, but that's the, uh, it's the amazing thing about the world we live in today. There's so much uh, incredible content that this person has put out into the world. Dr. Gabrielle Lyon is someone I've been listening to, I've read her book, followed closely, and I'm excited to have her with us today. Dr. Lyon, welcome to the Business of Advice podcast. I am so honored to be here. I love, I even love the title, Business of Advice Podcast. Uh, just amazing. Well, it, so this is, um, I've had a few people on focusing on this health this year, right? Because it, it's, typically we focus a little bit more on business, but I think everyone is starting to realize just how closely connected, you know, your, your health is to being a successful business owner. I know we have a lot of mutual friends. Rory Vaden introduced us, Ben Newman and Ed Mylett are some people they've heard on here. Um, so it, it's, I'm, I'm excited to have you on, even though I feel like I know you from, you know, following so much of your stuff. This, um, maybe talk here, I'll hold the book up. Forever Strong is an incredible book. This is one that's had a big influence on me. You know, I'll say, um, I think a big part for me was this idea, not, not that I hadn't always lifted, but really focusing a lot more on building muscle mass and just trying to lift heavier and build more of that. But maybe I'll start it out this way. Would you just share at a high level kind of your story and then maybe you follow that up with, um, I don't even want to say a high level, but just talking about the premise of the book Forever Strong and some of the things that you fundamentally believe about health and longevity, and then we'll we'll dive into some more specifics. Uh, certainly, I'm thrilled. The book Forever Strong really challenges the paradigm of overall health and wellness. I think as in business, just as in health, we hear something, for example, that we have an obesity epidemic and that this is the cause of all our challenges. And then we repeat it over and over and over again without actually challenging the framework and potentially exploring alternative options as if that is truly the root cause. And for decades, we've been hearing about how um, fat is a problem and we need to lose weight. And quite frankly, 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. Mm. And as in business, if you ask the right question, then you'll mm -hmm. get the appropriate response. But if you fail to be asking the right questions, you'll never get an answer that's meaningful. And that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because this book is a blueprint for everybody and anybody, whether you are a man, woman, or child, whether you are perimenopause, uh, an older male, you name it, you don't have to have any knowledge of nutrition. You'll pick up this book. This book is so well written that it allows an individual to learn the science in a way that they have never had to take a biology class ever. And yeah. it's actionable so that they can take the information and focus on what they have to gain instead of what they have to lose. Super actionable. I think I told you, I've, I've listened to you on so many different podcasts. And then when the book came out, I actually originally bought it for my wife just for some things. And then I started reading it and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. you know. And so um, let's dive into maybe some specific things that I want people to be able to walk away from here. I just mentioned it, but you know, muscle mass is one of the big, I think, I don't know, it's by far not the only takeaway, but I think it's one of the things I've heard you talk about over and over again. Would you just talk about why, you know, I don't know if we even want to call it lean muscle is so important. And then maybe a second follow-up to that is like, how do people understand if they have enough muscle mass? Great question. So muscle is the organ of longevity. Skeletal muscle is the organ of longevity. Muscle is an organ system. When we think about muscle, tell me where I'm wrong. We think about working out. We think about athletic performance. 
We think about being jacked and tan and in the gym wearing a skinny tank, but that's mm -hmm. actually only a side, a side portion of what muscle is really for. Skeletal muscle is the only organ system in the body that we have direct control over. It is and accounts for 40% of our body weight just by mass. It's the largest organ system. And the key components of skeletal muscle, number one, it's your metabolic sink. These diseases that plague us with aging, like cardiovascular disease, like dementia, like obesity, type two diabetes, these are not diseases that exist because of fat. These are diseases that exist and originate in skeletal muscle. In addition, skeletal muscle is your body armor. We have to understand that it's not if, it's a when we are going to face a health challenge. This is part of our humanness. Our safeguard against that for when it happens, not if, is skeletal muscle. We have to do everything in our power to hone in and focus on skeletal muscle from this perspective. I want to, um, I'm not going to say everyone who listens to this is, is middle age, but if you're going to look at the demographic, I think, you know, between the ages of kind of 35 to 60 is the primary audience or tends to be based on what we see. Uh, if you were going to speak to that age, what are, say someone has not lifted a lot um, or, or done things to build muscle, what are the best ways to build muscle safely, especially if like you're starting off? More than anything, I hope people listen to this and, and either go hire a trainer or start working out and trying to yeah. add muscle, right? So what, yeah. what are some of the best ways for them to build muscle safely? The best ways to build muscle safely are you can start with body weights, do progression, body weights. Machines are really, really wonderful. They get a bad rap. And then thinking about things that we do for functional movement. And when I say functional movement, I mean, we all walk. Most of us walk. Most of us carry things. You can easily add a ruck pack or a weighted vest or carry kettlebells. If you have not trained, it's never too late. But the reality is you have to take a moment and reflect upon some of the barriers to entry. Why have you not done this? because there is no such thing as a healthy sedentary person. Mm -hmm. Building muscle requires number one, appropriate stimulation of the skeletal tissue because it is looking for an adaptation. We have, and it doesn't take much. An individual could start with yoga three times a week. I worked on some of these earlier studies at the University of Illinois where there were uh, postmenopausal uh, women and all they had to do was do yoga twice a week and walk five days a week for 30 minutes. And they were able to maintain, if not improve their skeletal mm -hmm. muscle. On the flip side for men, they had to do that same amount, barely anything to just maintain and build muscle. Mm -hmm. The key component was incorporating dietary protein with resistance type exercise. Um, very simply in an ideal world, I'd love to see people lifting three to four days a week. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to do fancy lifts. You could easily start with a body weight squat, move up to a weighted squat. Before you even do that, you could go to the gym and do a hack squat. You could do a leg press. These are things that typically are not very injury prone. I was going to ask, so you, you shared a few there. Do you have any um, favorite muscle building lifts? You know, maybe that's, a, we do a lot of deadlifts. You know, the person I work out with loves those and, and they are great. Uh, but in any like suggestions on like, hey, here's some some muscle areas that maybe get overlooked sometimes or some lifts that are really, really good. Um, what I think that is really important is actually training for life. We're not training to become better at exercise. Yeah. We're really training for life. Things that I think are very valuable are carrying heavy kettlebells. Simple, not going to get injured. I'll grab two kettlebells, something. Sometimes I'll um, make them disproportionately weighted. I might have a 35 pound and a 55 pound. And I'll walk for as far as I can go, put it down, take a, a beat, walk again. Um, another thing, I think everyone should be able to do a push up. I do think people should be able to do pull ups. And the reason I, I think about these exercises is. How do we get stronger for life? If you mm -hmm. fall, you have to be able to push yourself off the ground. If God forbid there was some emergency, what if you had to pull yourself up? These are um, perishable skills that I do think that people should develop. 
That's um, you, you kind of mentioned it there. I, I know. So I'm just going to hit a bunch of things that I've taken away from listening to you or the book that, that I think are really important to share or that have been even really important for me. So you talked about the idea of protein. Uh, and so sometimes I think in the past that's people think meat, you know, now we have protein shakes. Now there's plant protein. Um, will you just I mean, this is a very open ended question. Talk a little bit about protein, the importance of it and what people should be looking for, how much they should be consuming. Any any just suggestions around that? Yeah. Dietary protein is the most controversial macronutrient <laughs> It is the black sheep of the macronutrient family. We have carbohydrates, fats and proteins. No macronutrient is as important as dietary protein as we age. Full stop. You, it is the only macronutrient in which your needs go up as you get older. Dietary protein comes in two forms, high quality and low quality. This quality is not an emotional statement. This quality is based on hard, fast biological numbers, which include the ratios of certain amino acids. And I know this isn't a science podcast. We're not going to go into the science. So hang with me. Protein, although we say it is if it is one thing, quite frankly, it is 20 different amino acids. These 20 different amino acids all come in various ratios in food choices. For example, beef has a different amino acid ratio than broccoli. Chicken has a different amino acid ratio than peanut butter. We have to understand that these foods are not interchangeable. And when I speak about high quality protein, I am talking about the following. Lean red meats, chicken, fish, eggs, dairy, and I'll include in that whey protein. These have the appropriate amino acid profiles to support healthy aging for skeletal muscle and all other factors that protein is required for. And the current RDA, so the current recommendations that we hear, you will hear in the chaos making machine of social media that Americans are overeating protein. I'd like to quantify that for you. <laughs> and the average female ingests 68 grams of protein a day. The average male is around 98 grams of protein a day. This is a sufficient amount, but this is not in any way, shape or form, form an optimal amount mm -hmm. to support body composition as evidenced by the fact that 70% of Americans mm -hmm. are either overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. The current recommendation that I give people is closer to one gram per pound ideal body weight. For example, if you are 100, if you are 200 pounds and you would like to get to 150 pounds, my protein goal for you is 150 grams of high quality protein. That could come in the form of lean red meats. It could come in the form of eggs. It could come in the form of whey protein. This macronutrient, dietary protein, the needs increase. Why do the needs increase in your 40s, 50s, and beyond? Because Skeletal muscle is a nutrient sensing organ, number one. Mm. Among other things that it does, it senses the quality of the diet. Its efficiency of sensing the quality of the diet goes down when we are no longer growing up. So kids can get away with a much lower protein mm. in your 20s. Until you are done growing, you can get away with a lower protein amount. But because skeletal muscle is exquisitely sensitive to the quality of protein. What we have found in the literature is that you must get to a certain level in the diet to then stimulate muscle tissue. And that's just for hard, fast takeaways where 40 to 50 grams of high quality protein comes in at the first meal of the day. When you wake from an overnight fast, the body is primed to ingest dietary protein. Mm -hmm. And when you hit that amount, you stimulate muscle. Why is that important? Because if you feed in a way that you always have, like in high school, where it was a bit haphazard, maybe you were on a moderate protein diet, you will not be able to support muscle as well as full body tissue turnover. Your liver is replenishing itself. Your gut is replenishing itself. Your skin, your hormones, you require dietary protein. And if you hit the needs of skeletal muscle, First, everything else falls into place. 
Are, are there, you know, there's so many fad diets, keto, vegan, car- all the things that are out there. Any just thoughts or suggestions on like um, what people should be doing? Yes. And I cover this all in my book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> first principles need to become first principles. We have decades and decades and decades of research that support a optimal protein diet. And what does that mean? That means whether you are keto or carnivore or all of these things, the evidence suggests that all of these diets are short-lived. The majority of vegans or vegetarians convert back. The majority of individuals going on a keto diet convert back to a more standard American diet. But an optimal protein diet, and when I say optimal, this number wouldn't be considered a high protein diet because we have to recognize that the reference ranges that we get right now, which is 0.37 grams per pound of body weight, that's the minimum to prevent a deficiency. Mm. If you were to double that, and that would be 0.7 grams per pound, that would be a moderate protein diet by definition. The minimum is 0.37. And again, these are dietary guidelines. Yep. Doubling that would be considered moderate. Anything above that would be can be considered closer to a higher protein diet. The evidence suggests that a higher protein diet can help correct body composition, lower body fat, and increasing muscle mass by just correcting the macronutrients in the diet. So if an individual is thinking, well, I want to try keto or carnivore and all these other diets, I can appreciate it. But I will say that the margin of error, the ability to be distracted by these fads, the cost of doing business of those behaviors become more and more detrimental each year you do it. That's good. Someone asked me, they're like, what are some of the things you've done over the last, and just to kind of, a lot of it came from your book. A lot of it came from listening to you. I'm like, I lift heavy four days a week and I eat 160 grams of good protein. <laughs> and I'm like, it's, cr- I mean, kind of back to those first principles, right? If someone's trying to figure out where to start, it's like figure out just a few of these basic things that you can take. And so I don't necessarily, someone's like, if you change your diet a lot, I'm like, no, just, you know, eating more protein, which isn't, maybe that's a quick follow-up question. You've kind of talked about it. Um, but any suggestions, because that can be a lot of protein to try and consume. That's one of the things I see. Or even early on, I've kind of fallen into a routine now. But like, I know you made some suggestions about what the quality of lean proteins. Any just advice on how to get that level in there? Because for a lot yeah. of people, if they've not ate 150 grams of protein a day, like when they start trying to do that and track it, it's like, that's a lot of protein. So Correct. And it doesn't, ha- one must understand that there can be a progression. Um, typically, just from a physiological perspective, it takes about two weeks if you were vegan or vegetarian, you know, you introduce these things slowly. If you've been on a lower protein diet, it takes a minute to catch up. Ways to do it, number one, most important practical takeaway, tactical way, nail your first meal of the day between 40 to 50 grams of protein. This is legitimately two scoops of a whey protein shake or a rice pea blend and throw in five grams of creatine. Everybody can do this. And the reason that I suggest this is because data out out of Heather Leidy's lab and others will show you that when you do this first meal correctly, you are much less likely to make poor choices later on. Mm -hmm. There's a whole host of um, GLP agonists, GLP-1 agonists, everyone's talking about Ozempic and Wagovi. The body has a natural ability to produce some of these hormones, these incretin hormones. Mm -hmm. And the way we do it is through dietary protein. And the evidence supports that hitting this robust amount of protein first thing in the morning, let's make it simple. Hmm. It could be two scoops of whey protein. It could be a cup of Greek yogurt with a scoop of protein powder in it. It could be an egg omelet. You could hit six eggs or five eggs and a little bit of turkey bacon. Easy. It legitimately can't get any easier. It's just a choice. Yep. No, that's great. I love starting it off. My problem's always been I hate eggs. As much as I try and eat them, I can't stand them. So so we do lots of whey protein instead. (laughs) Perfect. It doesn't have to be complicated to be correct. Yep, that's good. It doesn't even have to be sophisticated. It just has to be put in a place that allows individuals to take massive action and continue to do it. Because, listen, I care about humanity and I care about where we're going. And if we don't get this piece rice, 
this piece right, 100% of people eat. We have to get this piece right as a foundation of care. We spend $4 trillion in healthcare a year. That is not sustainable. The amount of disability, the amount of cardiovascular disease, the amount of falls, and then the metabolic consequences mm -hmm. of that thereafter, it is not sustainable. And it actually starts with us being willing to do the right thing on a very simple day-to-day -day basis. And it all starts with protein because it starts with optimizing skeletal muscle mass and allowing us to regain control of our appetites. That's good. Okay. I want to talk about a few other things that I think really, that you, you speak a lot on that really apply to entrepreneurs. Uh, I just listened to a podcast we were talking that you did with Ed Milet, uh, that was incredible. Everyone should go listen to it. You talked about two things in there that I, I feel like are critical. And I see it with so many of the advisors that we support, right? When you're, when you're a small business owner, entrepreneur out there, and those two things were stress management and sleep, can yeah. you talk about the importance of just both of those and then maybe any tips that you would have for a, a successful but busy entrepreneur on how they can manage stress better? And then we may even go a little deeper on sleep. There's a few things I want to ask you about there. I will tell you, I, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurial groups um, and I speak to them about stress, quite frankly. And there are a few factors. Number one, what we believe about stress is actually what we interpret in our physiology. And again, this goes back to my original statement that I had made in the beginning of this conversation is as humans, as once we get a paradigm of thinking, we believe that to be true, whether it's true or not. As humans, repetition makes things true for us. When I say stress, you say fight or flight. Mm -hmm. But what if I told you that there are two other stress responses that are much more adaptive? What if I told you there is the courage response and there is the tend and befriend response, both of which are an innate stress response in humans that can be cultivated? For example, my husband is a former Navy SEAL. He's getting ready to jump out of an airplane. His heart rate is up. Maybe it's 130 over 90. Our blood pressure is up. His heart rate might be increased. And his physiology is he is excited. He cannot wait to jump out of that airplane. Mm -hmm. I would be up there. I would probably be urinating on myself, <laughs> thinking this was the absolute worst idea that I have ever had. And if I make it out of this jump, I'm never doing this again. My heart rate is also 130 over 90 or my, my blood pressure, my heart rate is also extremely elevated, but my profile of catecholamines or these stress hormones are different, all because of the interpretation. Mm. He lands after the jump and he is invigorated. I land after the jump and I am so depleted and so wiped out that I cannot imagine doing anything else for the rest of the day. I had a fight or flight response while he had a courage response. And courage can be cultivated. We see this in studies using big snakes and MRI machines. It's, it's the reinterpretation of the external environment. Another example of this is the tendon befriend response. You and I both all know people that when they become stressed, they don't go into fight or flight. Instead, they reach out to other people and women really do this a lot. Yeah. How can I help you? Let's say your wife gets stressed maybe her response instead of a, a fight or flight is actually, honey, what can I do for you? Let me call a friend. It's all about community. That is also a stress response, both. And it actually allows for action to be taken because it allows them to kick into caretaking mode. Yeah. Entrepreneurs <clears throat> and within the echo chamber of entrepreneurs are always talking about stress and fight or flight. That is not a necessity. There is a courage response and there is a tend and befriend response. So when people start to experience stimulus, you have to pause and you have to gain control of your physiology. The military operators that I treat, a portion of my practice is all special operations as well as high level entrepreneurs, is it kicks them into a breathing. It kicks them into a four count breath, um, which is a four count in, deep breath in, hold for four counts, out for four counts. If everybody listening did that immediately, you would be able to manage your physiology and reinterpretation of the stimulus instead of fear, let's go.
I got this. I've done this a million times. This is exactly where I need to be so that I can move to the next level. The other thing, so number one, stress, the way that we think about it is incorrect. The second thing is a neutral mindset. The best of the best understand their points of vulnerability. And I teach entrepreneurs about this all the time. I had one entrepreneur, and I'll put this into context. Yeah. Every year in Vegas, he puts on a massive event. Thousands of people come to his massive event. The months leading up to the event, he's super hyped up. Right before the event, the day before, the week before, he is on high alert. He is thinking about what is the next car to buy? What is the next thing to do in business? The, you know, he is full mode of what, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? This is a point of vulnerability. It's predictable. Every year I ask him, okay, the week before, hmm. what kind of car are you going to buy? <laughs> totally predictable. Yep. Everyone has their own iteration of what they're doing. Maybe they're shopping more. Maybe they're looking to buy a new business. Maybe at this high point, they're looking to do X, Y, and Z. That is a point of vulnerability. As high as that person goes is as low as they are going to drop. Mm. Everybody has experienced this, my friend, including you. I guarantee that after a big launch, after a big business, as high as you went, all of a sudden you find yourself for a moment depressed. Mm. All of a sudden, the month, the day after the big event, the day after the big sale, the day after the graduation, the day after you achieve a goal, you go as low as the previous high. This is it simply stated this dopamine uh, somewhat reward system, but it's predictable. And that low point is another point of vulnerability. And from a health standpoint, this takes people off. They start eating bad. They decide they just can't work out anymore. It gets them off the rails. What becomes so detrimental is, can you imagine doing this every time, hmm. all day long? The best of the best don't have these highs and lows. You talk to Ben, or you, you know, you talk to Ben Newman. You talk to Bedros Koulian. All of all, these are all patients of mine, and I'll ask them. So you know, I know you have this event coming up. Uh, as we talked about off camera, yeah. being a physician is, is much more than just, hey, how's your blood work? Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you amped up for this major, major event? Let me tell you how many times they've ever said yes. Zero. Completely neutral. Hmm. You have a big book, big book launch, do it completely neutral. That can be trained. And the way in which you train it over time is to not celebrate every win. Do not purposely get everything you'd like. Very simply, I might book a really large podcast. I got invited on Good Morning America. Do you think I get pumped for these things? No, because I know the cost of doing business is yeah. too great. How do I practice that? I have little successes that I don't celebrate. Hmm. And the listener is probably like, oh, that seems depressing. I'm not <laughs> saying don't celebrate every win. Sure. I'm celebrating, I'm saying choose wins to celebrate, flip a coin. I got to publish a, a paper published. I got a blog published. You know, maybe it was a, a really big deal. I might not celebrate that. I'll flip a coin. Heads I celebrate, tails I don't. I like that. Um, okay, that's like uh, stress management's a big one. You said something there that, that resonated with me. I, I'd not really put it together. You know, one of the things that, when advisors join us, um, we, we, talk, we do a lot of events. We bring them together a lot. Actually, while we're recording this, we have 120 advisors in our office right now that are here as a training. And what I've told them all the time is I said, you know, what I've seen now over the last 19 years is the magic. And when I see this incredible growth in their business when they join us, I'm like, you know, if I were going to simplify it, I said the thing that I've watched is that it because they're – entrepreneurs sometimes on an island, just being able to come together with another community of like-minded people about every 
60 days, about every two months, we, we bring them all together. I'm like, it takes some of those highs and lows out of it, right? It's just this ability to kind of constantly recharge yourself. So even that, that idea of that community that you plug into, tend and befriend is a, a big, big part of that. That's, yeah. I never really connected that to like, it probably just makes them a better business owner entrepreneur because it's leveling out some of that, those stress and you know fluctuation points. A million times over. Yeah a million times over and it's predictable. Yeah. And if we begin to create a conversation where we can repeat these things, then what it's going to do for the next generation of entrepreneurs is it's going to make them more effective yep. and be able to really move the needle for humanity in a positive way. We've been sold a bag of lies, unfortunately, that fight or flight yep. is the only way and that stress is bad. In fact, stress makes us rise to our capacity. Hmm. You can have ability and skill, but you still have to develop capacity. You can have ability and skill, but capacity must be developed to hold the situation, to hold the challenges, and to be able to do something about them. And the way that it, capacity is cultivated is by correctly understanding our environment. That's good. I love it. Uh, okay, let's talk about the second big one, uh, sleep. And you, you, I know you're I'm terrible been, at this. But <laughs> talk about it. Yeah, it's. But um, you know, it, maybe I'll set it up this way. Like I've actually always slept really, really well. I say it's one of the, the great benefits. I uh, track. There's a lot of things I do to make sure I'm sleeping well. But um, I was sharing this before with you off camera. I had a good friend who had sleep apnea, didn't really realize it, you know. But eventually went and got tested, you know, got a sleep apnea machine. And he told me, he's like, I don't understand how I was even functioning before right now. Now, understanding what it feels like to get a good night of sleep or, or a better night of sleep and just how much better I am. Can you talk about, I, I, I say sleep in general, but I'm seeing more and more people that are struggling with sleep apnea. I think there's some misconceptions around it, but then maybe just, I, I think people underestimate how harmful bad sleep can be too. So just, I know it's a very general, you know, throw it out there, but can we talk a little bit about sleep and the value of that? Yeah. First of all, in full disclosure, I'm terrible at it. I have two very little children. Um, my husband wakes up at 4 a.m. every morning. <laughs> so I, I, I think that there's something very important about have, oops, sorry, about having transparency and honesty in yeah. conversation. And sleep is critical. Any parent with a three-year-old and a five-year-old will tell you <laughs> it's nearly impossible. Um, here are the risks of not sleeping. Number one, your body composition will not be the same. We've seen it in shift workers. There is an increased risk of cancer for individuals that have a out of alignment circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm is the 24 hour light dark cycle and making sure you're sleeping when you're supposed to be sleeping and eating when you're supposed to be eating. When you do things where you're staying up late, then that's all out of alignment. Yep. That is a risk of cancer. There is a higher risk of cancer for those night shift workers. Sleep is really important for repair and regulation. It's really important for blood sugar control. The other thing that sleep is really important for is brain function. If you are not sleeping, there's a risk for dementia because the time at which the brain cleans itself is during sleep. Mm -hmm. In addition, atrial fibrillation, cardiovascular disease, blood pressure, if you are not sleeping and you are not breathing in your sleep, you are putting your heart at risk. You are also putting your hormones at risk. The decline is very precipitous. It's um, it's such an important one. And I know that's one of the things that a lot of people sacrifice, right? Especially entrepreneurs. It's like, hey, we're, we're gonna sacrifice that. But I, I, I've seen it with so many and I've heard you and others talk about it. So any, um, e even if you're not good at it, any suggestions on what people could or should be doing to improve their sleep? Yes. And these are things that I do. Number one, a, a standard sleep and wake time. Try to keep that very consistent. Also understand, be really tough on yourself. And I'm not good at this. You are not going to be effective after say 930 at night. Just shut yep. it down. Yep. Shut it down and understand that this is a non-negotiable full transparency. I don't do that because, <laughs> because I have, I have little children yeah. and I owe them that time and there's only so many hours in a day. Um, so whether you're getting up early or going to bed late, but but really having consistent sleep time is, is important. Sleep-wake time, earplugs, eye mask, dark room. 
earplugs, eye masks, darkroom. We've all heard about that. Getting off your screens, we know this. A very Another a very underappreciated factor in getting a good night's sleep is actually being outside first thing in the morning. Mm. Spending as much time outside as you can early. Hmm. A good night's sleep starts in the morning. That's good. So some good tips. Any, uh, like one of the things I've done that has been helpful, I'm just curious if what your thoughts is like uh, cooling our, our mattress. So we have like a, a eight sleep, I think is what we use now, but like any thoughts around that or the, the benefit of those? It's worked well for me. I don't know if that's just my mind or. If... No, I actually had a eight sleep mattress for a very long time and an eight sleep mattress or a chili pad. I've had both. Yep. It cools the bed. Yep. Um, and for individuals that are hot, um, and typically guys like it really cold and women like it warm. It's just a whole thing. And <laughs> depending on which side of the bed you're on, uh, it can be very helpful in keeping the room cool, Yeah. whether it's 65 to 68 degrees. Yeah. Good. Okay. I, I think I, the biggest takeaway, the biggest takeaway that is underappreciated is that a good night's sleep starts in the morning mm. because we have this natural rise in melatonin. Yep. Um, and being outside and anchoring in sunlight and spending time outside is really important and it, difficult. So, so for example, if you are going to take, you interface with a ton of entrepreneurs, you can take the call walking outside. Hmm. I know everybody says, ah, oh, well, um, you know, I have to be on Zoom. Then take the treadmill outside. Put it outside your, I know it sounds crazy. Find a way versus find an excuse. You do these things and you will have better outcomes. They seem it, odd and seem extreme. Try it. You, you mentioned melatonin more than natural being outside. I, any a quick question, any sleep supplements, anything at all that you think is helpful um, or maybe things that aren't <laughs> either side of that? Um, I, I think that there's a couple ways to think about it. There are very safe medications that can be used. Some of the entrepreneurs need, depending on, again, please understand that there are the natural and there are pharmaceuticals and the best combination is probably somewhere in the middle of both depending on where what season someone is in yep. for example if someone is in a crazy push season and it is unavoidable then something like trazodone is very safe for sleep it is non-addictive a lot of entrepreneurs use it intermittently um, and it can be very safe uh, a really good friend of mine he's also a for he's a former navy seal and physician named dr kirk parsley he makes a product called sleep remedy it's wonderful we use it for a lot of the military people. It has a little bit of melatonin and other herbs in it. It even has vitamin D in it. it helps people sleep magnesium. Um, and then, so those are the two things. And then obviously L-theanine in the evenings work. And there's research behind that. Um, I don't recommend CBD gummies because I think that that affects the brain negatively mm. over time. That is, is, is just a consideration. And then not having a super heavy meal before bed not eating right before bed. There may be some research coming out that a um, ice bath a couple hours before bed could be very helpful. It's hmm. good. Okay. If I want to ask you a, a question completely off health, um, but before I do that, and, and then we'll jump into these lightning round questions. People are listening today. They say, love what you're saying, on board with it. I want to improve my health. What would you recommend this? Just like a couple first or next steps? Number one, fix your diet. 100% of you listening, eat. Make it simple. Get one gram per pound ideal body weight of protein. Done. So easy. You can't go wrong. I don't want to track. I don't want to do those things. Get your first and your last meal right. 40 to 50 grams of protein. What does that look like? It looks like six ounces of a steak, of a lean meat. It looks like, you know, seven ounces of a fish, a couple eggs, two scoops of protein. Again, you can go to my website, actually, and I have a, a whole conversion list. It's yep. totally free. Um, you could put it in MyFitnessPal so you know how much protein. It's your responsibility to know the numbers because you do it. Yep. Number one, fix your protein. Number two, in that same vein, nail that first and last meal. Number three, do some form of resistance exercise. Mm. Number four, reinterpret stress. Welcome it. You've got butterflies. Those butterflies should be in attack mm -hmm. formation. And number five, recognize your points of weakness. We all know where we fail. Hmm. You must uncover your points of weakness and exploit them. For example, every Friday night, I take the kids for ice cream. I take them to swimming lessons and we go for ice cream. 
if I was going to not pay attention to myself every Friday night, I would have the ice cream. But I know. I plan for it. I say, you know what? I'm probably going to want this. And then I said, well, maybe I'll have it next week. And I plan for it. I already in my mind know what I'm going to do. And I put a structure in place where, no, nope, I'm going to do that next week. And the next week comes. And then I say, I'm going to do it next week. So I know where I'm going to fail. And every, every person who's the best of the best at what they do, they all know their points of weaknesses. That's good. Number one, dietary protein, one gram per pound ideal body weight. If you care about your brain function, you care about being a good entrepreneur for the long haul, you have to do this. Number two, nail your first and last meal, 40 to 50 grams of protein. If you want to have carbohydrates, make it a one-to-one -one ratio. Number three, do resistance exercise. I'm not talking about hours of cardiovascular activity or zone two training that's having its moment right now. Lift weights. This is not interchangeable. Number four, reinterpret stress. Don't buy into fight or flight. Don't buy into the stress response. And number five, know and plan for your weaknesses. That's good. You do that, you are going to double or triple your income by next year. I love it. Okay. Now I said I had a question completely off the topic of health. You have built an incredible following. Um, so many of the advisors we support are trying to do the same, right? Anything that you have found to be the most valuable thing as you've built kind of your your profile or your following? Uh, obviously, the book I know has been a big part of it, but just any tips you have around this, you're trying to build your profile, like what, what has been really beneficial to you? You point out something important. I am a physician, but I'm also an entrepreneur. Yeah. I have three sectors of my business, actually four sectors of my business. I have a very large podcast, The Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. It's number four in medicine mm -hmm. country, number usually around 22 in all of health and wellness, hundreds and thousands of downloads per month. I also have a media side to my business, which includes speaking, which includes um, advisory roles in many different companies. I have a publishing part of my business. So I, I wrote a New York Times bestseller. I have two more books that are going to be coming out. And um, the email, social media, YouTube version of my business. Mm -hmm. Yep. In addition to a full concierge medical practice. So I have four different forms of my business. The first piece of advice is, and people are not going to like this. People always ask me, Gabrielle, how did you get where you are? The first piece of advice is be really good at what you do. Mm. There are no shortcuts. I have 17 years of education and I'm going back to do a research scholarship in sexual medicine. 17 years of professional education and I'm still going back to school as a research scholar. That's good. That's crazy. So number one, be really good at what, what you do. Number two, be willing to do what other people won't. And number three, have integrity and have relationships. Be truly about giving and not about taking. I think a secret sauce of my success has been I truly am a servant to humanity. Yeah, yeah. It is not about me being famous. It is not about me doing the thing. It is truly about me being the best physician I can be, being the best caretaker, being the best to people in my sphere as I possibly can. And I think in the space of entrepreneurship, people are all about the take. And I was never about that and mm -hmm. I'm never about that. And I think that, you know, when you saw my book come out, my book was the number one non-selling, the not the number one non-fiction selling book in all of the Simon and Schuster imprint that I worked with, hmm. that, which was called Atria. And the reason is, is because I had support from the biggest entrepreneurs in the world. Yep. From the biggest physicians in the world, to the best Navy SEALs in the world, <laughs> to the best motivational speakers in the world. I had the best people in all of these industries rally to support my book. Number one, because the message is phenomenal and it's evidence-based and it makes the world a better place. But number two, I have meaningful relationships mm -hmm. with all of these people and I've always done right by them without expecting anything in return. 
That's good. As, as someone who's listened, followed you, you that, that comes across, right? And I know we were talking about the the podcast you did with Ed. I mean, it really came across in that, right? I, I would say just like more your, your care and compassion for him than anything else. Um, so I appreciate that and great advice. Okay, I want to get you out of here, uh, ask you these quick lightning round questions. They can be short, short kind of answers here at the end. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, going back to COVID, is there a lesson either you learned or maybe one that just got really reinforced with you that you know you're going to carry forward for the rest of your your career or life? For for COVID during COVID, yeah, yeah, I think just like as it made you rethink, like, okay, what what, what did I learn through this? Yeah, um, I would say that I didn't learn anything, but just be really ready to pivot and be mm. self sufficient. I was actually very well planned for COVID, yeah, because I had already been thinking outside the box in general. Yeah. Good. Um, second question. What is the one thing that you have done that graduated you from being good to great? I'll say a good doctor to a great doctor, but let's just say a good uh, entrepreneur to a great one. Time. And what do you mean by time? Like how you manage time, it? You learn lessons. Oh, yeah. You learn lessons. And I'm highly coachable. And quite frankly, I'm extremely, extremely driven. Yeah. Extremely mission driven. That's good. Okay. Third question. Is there something that you are doing to drive your own personal growth this year that, that has you excited? Yes. Um, I am going to take, I'm going to break through the, to the mainstream this year. Okay. That's my challenge. Nice. That'll be a big one. Yep. Okay. Um, fourth question. What is a book? It can't be your book, but what is the one book that you have recommended the most to other, I'll say entrepreneurs? Relentless Good by one. Tim Grover. Yep. Great book. Okay. Final question. Best piece of advice that you've ever received? The best piece of advice that I've ever received. That is, I can't really say it because there's kind of a swear word in it. <laughs> um, so I have to think of my second best, best piece of advice. Um, Hmm. That has me stumped. Now you have me curious on the first one. You know, we can bleep it out or something I'll, if we I'll, need I'll to. No, I'll tell you about it off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> think about it. I'm married to a Navy SEAL. Yeah. So <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know what? I, I don't know, but I can give a few pieces, a few pieces of advice. I yeah. would say um, be really comfortable failing. And know that if you're not failing in some capacity, you are definitely not pu pushing yourself yeah. enough. Yep. Because I think when we become really good, there is a complacency that can set in where we don't fail a lot. And, you know, I was reflecting on this yesterday with a very dear friend. And I, and I realized that um, if you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not doing enough. That's that's a great piece of advice. I, ironically, I was interviewing someone else on the podcast, Will Gadara. He was the the owner of Eleven Madison Park. He said something fascinating about that. Um, the first year that they got nominated for the best restaurants in the world, you know, which is to even make the list is like you know massive accomplishment. But they went to this event and they finished last. They they were the very last ranked restaurant. Even but even being that is incredible. But he said, you know what's funny, Cody? Had we finished like 23rd, I don't think we ever would have became number one because we would have got complacent. But the fact that, that we were finished last, it just pushed us to like, that's never going to happen again. And I think that's kind of what you said, right? If you're not failing, if there's not some failure there, you're probably not pushing hard enough. So Dr. Lyon, thank you for the time today. Um, just so much value that I know is going to help so many people, which is I know what you're ab about completely. I've talked about the book, but what are the best ways for people to follow you and uh, just, you know, benefit from your advice? Yeah. Um, well, if you wanted to do more, obviously you can join. We have actually, I don't know when this is coming out, but we are opening up our launching our challenge, a protein forward challenge, April 1st. Okay. Um, again, I don't know when this is coming out, but it is, we had thousands of people go through this challenge and it's just extraordinary. It really puts these things into practice and we have myself come on people come on like how are you going to do this nutrition mm -hmm. thing super fun very valuable very low cost we're launching that april 1st you can go to my website you can sign up for my newsletter i give away a ton of free content yep my podcast is the dr gabrielle lyon show 
my medical practice, we have a team of eight. We have a whole team. If you are interested in these things, then we do have providers that are extraordinary. Um, if an individual is interested in seeing myself, then um, you can always apply. Someone will contact you at some point unless you know a patient of mine already. Uh, that's the best and fast way. <laughs> I only take one, really one patient a month, maybe two patients a month. Uh, but in the next two months, I do have, I think I have another spot um, in the next two months coming up. Awesome. Well, um, what, what I would leave everyone with is like make an investment in your health because I, I say it all the time at the end, like we need more great leaders and, and your health is a huge part of being a great leader. So thank you so much for the time, for everything you're awesome. doing to help people, you know, uh, achieve just optimal health. And the book is for everybody. So let's see, where is it here? Right here. I'll hold it up too. <laughs> this book, Forever Strong, um, really well written. It and is. It actually touches on the mindset component too. Yep, you did. Awesome job on it. So thank you so much again for the time. Thank you so much for having me.